A year and a half ago, we made a video wherein a $1,000 Intel Hackintosh was bested by what was then the first Apple Silicon M1 Mac Mini. And I subsequently declared the future of Hack Macs all but dead. That's certainly still true, as we'll discuss later, but the video's title ended in a question mark. And Betteridge's law of headlines states that any title ending in a question mark can be answered with no. So this is the real last Hackintosh, right? We call it Winter's Last Whisper, a computer running macOS Ventura, and an impressive computer at that. It has 10 gigabit ethernet, it has DisplayPort pass-through via Thunderbolt, enabling the use of an Apple Studio Display or Pro Display XDR. Really, it, it does everything you would expect a real Mac to do, but better, because it outperforms the $4,000 M1 Ultra Mac Studio. Oh, and uh, it does so at half the cost. Apple is done releasing Intel-based Macs, but they're not done supporting them. I mean, they still currently sell an Intel machine, the Mac Pro. Time will only tell how many future revisions of macOS will support Intel and x86, but Apple has set the precedent of maintaining their computers for about six to seven years, and I don't expect that to change. This does not mean, however, that Hackintoshes will have that same long-term support if built today. Because starting with 2017 Macs, Apple's T2 coprocessor acted as a new controller for disks, SMC, audio, and more, and it's ARM-based. As of yet, there is no way to bypass or emulate it, and so it's possible that as soon as later this year, Hackintoshes will be stuck forever on the last supported version of macOS if macOS chooses to support only the T2 going forward. But that day has yet to come, and current generation processors are supported in Ventura. So we elected to use an Intel i7-13700K. That processor is cooled by a Noctua DH15, which I feel hits a great price to performance ratio, and it certainly packs a punch, with eight performance and eight efficiency cores. Now, what's not current gen is our GPU. In Winter's Last Whisper, we are using an AMD 6800 XT, and that's because Apple added graphic support for Navi 2X in late 2021, because they released updated workstation cards for the Mac Pro. Which I guess answers the question, well then, why not a current gen card? Well, there's still no Radeon Pro variant of the 7000 series, and that's the only variety that Apple uses. But even when AMD does eventually roll those cards out, there's no guarantee that Apple will sell or support them. Alas, it's no matter, because this GPU is still an excellent value and a superb performer, particularly considering Apple Silicon's Achilles heel has always been GPU performance. This is gonna do great. As for our other components, well, we arguably went a little overkill. The motherboard is a Gigabyte Z690 Aero D, an ATX size board that's blinged out with onboard Thunderbolt, two and a half gigabit and 10 gigabit LAN, DisplayPort pass-through, a high impedance headphone amplifier and more. Uh, we've also got 64 gigs of DDR5-5600 memory, in addition to a one terabyte Samsung 980 Pro NVMe SSD. All of that slots into the board, and then we take those guts and fit them into the fabulously handsome Fractal Torrent ATX case. Uh, this thing also has an attic mounted power supply, which I love, this is a throwback to old PCs. That power supply is a Corsair 1000 watt 80 plus gold, which is going to give our build its first signs of life. The looks befit the price, a price that's not cheap, but it's also not outlandishly expensive. And frankly, we could have gone a lot more thrifty on several components, but I really wanted to match the Mac Studio spec for spec as cheaper Hackintoshes, well, they'll often skip out on IO and disc performance, power supply quality, and more that Apple truly does an excellent job with, but seldom receives credit for. Now, turning a pile of PC parts into a functioning Hackintosh has become more nuanced than it used to be. A few years ago, you could download a couple tools to auto-compile a thumb drive, and using the Clover bootloader be up and running with a new Hackintosh in minutes. OpenCore, the new norm and what I used for this machine, is, is not that. Creating a Hackintosh in 2023 has a steeper learning curve and is more involved than it used to be, but it's worth it because OpenCore has a number of huge advantages. For one, it's built with modern UEFI standards, which permits better hardware compatibility, including support for AMD processors. And it 
offers resilience against future macOS updates. It's rare that you can't just update a open core Hackintosh like any other Mac. Additionally, there are way fewer crashes and Hackintosh oddities due to strict adherence to Apple's bootloader structure. And because of that, OpenCore even supports a file vault and secure boot, ensuring a safe macOS experience on a non-Mac. And while it's a little trickier to build an open core installer, the post install experience is much better. And the incredible documentation doesn't just tell you how to make a Hackintosh, but it teaches you how and why things work, which arms you with the knowledge that you will want should future troubleshooting become necessary. Now, I do hope that I haven't scared you off because it really isn't that hard. You install Mac OS onto a USB drive, add the base open core files, which is as easy as dragging and dropping, and then you follow the guide to determine which drivers and kecks are needed for your given hardware. This is also easy. Then it comes to our ACPI configuration. Uh, what? <laughs> In short, ACPI is a standard that helps your computer hardware and software communicate with one another by managing uh, power and system configurations. Now, ACPI is like the conductor of an orchestra, and macOS, a system strictly designed for specific hardware, freaks out if the conductor deviates from the sheet music that macOS is looking at. It's not a jazz musician. So we have to use what are called description table patches to help align our musician and conductor using modified sheet music that they can both understand. Using your target machine, so the PC that you're going to install stuff on, you run a Python script called SSDT time, which dumps your ACPI information from your PC's firmware into a file that you can then automatically patch to ensure that there's no conflicts between your hardware and what macOS expects easy. So then what's the hard part? Well, where most people get fouled up is with the config.plist file. This is an XML document you modify that basically handles the whole boot process by making sure that all of those files we added are properly injected at the right time, in addition to doing a few other things like spoofing the model of Mac that we have and a corresponding serial number to boot. Now, where people get stuck in this process is through lethargy. It's really tempting to find someone online who has the same or close to the same hardware as you, copy their config.plist file, and boom, you're done. Don't do this, because there are so many variables at play. And with a little patience, you can build your own config.plist file all by yourself and one that's guaranteed to run on the hardware. It's really not hard and the documentation walks you through the whole process. So don't cut corners and do it right. And once your config.plist is built, you can boot right into the Mac OS installer. And the OS is frankly, none the wiser. You're on a Mac, but we're not quite done yet. Once you've finished installing the OS, there are a few steps afterwards that we do need to follow. For one, we need to move OpenCore from your uh, USB drive to your actual machine so that we can boot into macOS without the USB key plugged in. <laughs> and speaking of USB, we're also going to need to address that because macOS is limited to 15 USB ports. And my board, well, it has more than that with the internal headers on my uh, motherboard as well as the I.O. And in addition to that, macOS really sucks at guessing which port is what speed and you're going to run into issues if you don't define that. Yet again, there is another great tool that mostly automates this for you. And once you're finished with that, well, you're likely to be running a golden Hackintosh. Our build has functioning Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, two and a half gigabit and 10 gigabit LAN, which consequentially means we can use AirDrop and HandOff and other macOS niceties. iMessage, the App Store, Safari, they all work great. I've even got functioning Thunderbolt 3 for high throughput devices, and I can even pass through DisplayPort over Thunderbolt using my motherboard's internal header connected to my GPU. System integrity protection and file vault, those are both enabled. Audio, it works perfectly. Really, this is pretty much a perfect Mac. Pretty much, nearly. There are three weird bits about this computer. Number one. I had to disable three USB ports at the back of the machine to come in under my 15 port limit. Number two, sidecar, yeah, that doesn't work because there's no support for 13th gen uh, iGPU drivers inside of macOS, which is a little bit of a bummer. And number three, Intel's big little core design, it is not respected by macOS. And so the operating system believes that the performance and efficiency cores are all to be the same, that they're created equal. 
they're not. So you will get a uh, imbalance of the power efficiency and performance that you would get in Windows by scheduling tasks. Uh, optimization is lost a little bit, theoretically. Practically, <laughs> practically, this machine is insane. How insane? Well, why don't we let the numbers speak for themselves? Starting with everyone's favorite heavily Mac biased benchmark, Geekbench 6, Winter's Last Whisper hangs really close to the multi-core performance of the M1 Ultra, but much to my surprise, obliterates its single core performance with nearly 15% faster results. Now in the GPU department, Geekbench's metal compute test also gives the Hackintosh the upper hand by more than 30%. Moving to media tests, because YouTuber, we see that in another synthetic load, Cinebench, our HackMac silences the Mac Studio yet again. That trend continues as we move into actual video editing applications like DaVinci Resolve and Final Cut Pro. Hilariously, we had a number of effects errors causing Final Cut to actually crash on Apple Silicon, bugs that haven't been fixed in almost a year, where our Intel Hackintosh, the machine that theoretically should be less stable, never crashed running Final Cut Pro even once. Furthermore, we did notice a general performance improvements on our Hackintosh over the M1 Max Mac Studio when scrubbing through raw footage in all NLEs. This behavior doesn't exhibit itself, of course, when you're using H.265 or ProRes footage because the M1 has native media engines for those codecs. But that extra computing, that raw power, that extra oomph does come in handy for formats like Red Raw, for example. Now, on the other hand, when running Puget Bench for Adobe Premiere Pro, the Hackintosh finished behind the Apple Silicon machines. Why? Well, Apple Silicon's video engines, as we just discussed, are designed to encode and decode a myriad of file formats insanely quickly. And Clever Memory Swap helps write stuff to disk with incredible speed. What it lacks in raw compute, needed for, say, applying effects, is more than made up for elsewhere. Now, moving on from video, benchmarks in both creative and development environments give our Ventura veneered PC the dub again and again and again. But where we notice the greatest performance disparity is in a category that should be, well, no surprise to anybody that's been paying attention to Apple Silicon, and that's in the GPU performance department. Running Unigen in heaven, our PC does spin its fans up a little tiny bit, even with our modified fan curve, though it sounds and creates a more pleasing whooshing sound than when you compare it to the Mac Studio, which basically screams very shrill at full load. And at nearly double the performance and half the cost, things are starting to look a little bit embarrassing. Moving to real world gaming performance playing Tomb Raider on both machines in Mac OS, well, it gets worse. Or better, I guess, depending on which side you find yourself on. Boot that same Hackintosh into Windows, load up that same title, and the machine pulls away yet again. And that's really the benefit to a Hackintosh. It is an equally performant Windows computer with a huge catalog of games, if gaming's your thing. Now, another thing that can be done super well in macOS Hactura is that Windows 11 can be virtualized nicely. There's no need to rely on crappy ARM variants of Windows. This is full hog x86 Windows if you don't want to dual boot between systems, which you can do, not on Apple Silicon. Now, don't get me wrong, I love Apple Silicon, and I think that Apple is currently making the best computers that it has ever made. But I also think that there's been this weird idolization of Apple Silicon chips, this perception that Apple is ahead in every department. Now, make no mistake, Apple's chip design is leading the consumer industry in a lot of areas, as I talked about in my recent video concerning software-defined hardware. You should definitely go check that out if you haven't seen it. But Apple's chips are not market leaders in raw performance, and they never have been. Frankly, save for the M1 Ultra, Apple has yet to make a chip that even gets hot enough to not work in a thin and light laptop. Running at full tilt with absolutely everything maxed out, including power delivered over every single port on the M1 Ultra Mac Studio, a wattage that you will never come close to in the real world, that machine pulls 215 watts from the wall. Compare that to our Hackintosh, the CPU can draw up to 350 watts just by itself. When surfing the web, our Hackintosh pulls more than seven times as much power from the wall as our M1 Max Max Studio. And under load, say when gaming, it's more than five and a half times. 
Now, in fairness, our M1 Max vastly underperforms the Hackintosh when gaming, but even adjusting for watts per frame, Apple Silicon still finds itself almost two and a half times more efficient. But in a home environment, why does that really matter? Because even as a heavy computer user, you're likely to only find a cost savings of $50 to $100 in energy annually. It would take you nearly 30 years to pay for, in energy, the $2,000 premium that the Mac Studio would cost you over our Hackintosh if built today. So then why would you ever buy a real Mac? Well, first, smaller power draw means a smaller thermal footprint, which results in a smaller computer significantly smaller. The Mac Studio is insanely powerful for how absolutely tiny it is. Second, if you don't want the hassle of building and maintaining a hack Mac, the trope, it just works, isn't a trope. A real Mac just works all the time. Third, you identify a moral issue when you willfully violate the Mac OS end user license agreement you agreed to, that you wouldn't install the operating system on unauthorized hardware. But fourth, Last, and perhaps most importantly, Apple Silicon is a clear path forward. Applications will only continue to get more and more optimized for the coprocessors and specialized hardware blocks that have been designed to handle specific workloads better than the general purpose compute cores that are found on our Hackintosh. And when Apple finally gets around to releasing a chip that isn't designed to be hyper-efficient or thermally constrained, no, a chip designed to scream, a Mac Pro chip, scream it will. But until then, well, we've got this, and uh, this is pretty great. Let me know in the comments down below if you have recently built a Hackintosh, or if you now plan to do so in the near future. Please subscribe, leave this video a like, but most importantly, and as always, stay snazzy.